Our next hymn that we're going to sing this morning is hymn number 229, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Let angels prostrate fall. I know you've been sitting for a while. Let's stand and sing this one. to sing that song in heaven to Jesus face to face. Won't that be awesome? We're going to turn to hymn number 248, Oh How I Love Jesus, 248. Jesus, you'll want to be everywhere and anywhere Jesus is. Our next song will be Anywhere with Jesus, hymn number 508.
worthy. He leadeth me. 537, he leadeth me. 537.
Good morning and happy Sabbath. You guys sound happy. That's good. Amen. We are happy because we get to celebrate this event with our seniors. We are also we're also happy because it's the Sabbath day, and it's a holy day, and it's a sunny day on top of all that. So we praise the Lord for that, especially in Michigan. When we see sunshine, we're happy. I want to ask that you do me a favor. I know I'm looking out, and I'm seeing that we're packed in, but I also am seeing some pews that could use a few more people, and I'm looking at the back of the church, and it's going to be a long service to be standing this long. So if you could squeeze in to the center of your pew, that would be greatly appreciated to allow others an opportunity to, to rest during this time, to get their Sabbath day's rest. I want to thank the juniors for their contribution this morning to Sabbath school. I'm sure that we were all blessed by that. I want to thank the choristers in between Sabbath school and church for a very hearty song service. I was just standing in the back listening and thinking, whoa, that sounds awesome. It sounds angelic. This is what heaven is going to be like. And I will get to join, and the good Lord's going to give me the opportunity to stay on tune and everything. I can't wait. I have a few announcements uh, just so we're all in the loop as to what's happening today. Uh, just want to remind you if you've received a program that looks like this, this is a weekend graduation program, please hang on to your program. We have printed many copies but not as many for everyone to have a copy each of the services. So hang on to it and bring it back to Vespers tonight and then take it to uh, graduation commencement service tomorrow morning as well. I want to remind the seniors, the graduates, of their special class meeting tonight at 6.30 in the chapel. This is a new event and I'm not going to go into too much detail. All I'm going to say is that this is an event for them, by them, and exclusively for them. Now, we have the privilege as parents and as family members to just be silent observers of what's happening. They're going to have a, a, a last few moments together, and this is not an opportunity for parents and family members to contribute. This is just for them. They're not even going to be miked. Um, you're welcome to come, but again, just as as silent uh, members of, of, of the audience. I also want to remind, uh, remind all of you that there will be a Vespers tonight here in the church. And in my program, that says 815. So we want to welcome all of you to come to that. And you will participate in worshiping during that time with our seniors and our juniors this year, which is a neat uh, change of events. It's always been the seniors. Now we're going to do something cohesive and collaborative with the seniors and the juniors together, and I'm excited to worship the Lord under their leadership this evening. Amen. Parents, there's an alumni reception tonight from 9.45 to 10.30 in the Commons. This is for the seniors, the graduates, and their immediate family members. This is not for the alumni of the school. This is to welcome them into the Alumni Association. And uh, so those of you who are alumni of the school already, we're glad that you're here, but this is a special event for them and their immediate family members. Parents, I just want to remind you one more time, each of, each of the graduates have received 10 tickets for the commencement service tomorrow morning. Those of you with tickets will be allowed admittance to the fitness center at 9 o'clock. From 9 to 9.40, it will be, uh, you would be, you'll be admitted into the fitness center only with a ticket in hand, okay? And we will not be reserving seats either. This is just for those with tickets in hand. And then we'll open it up to everyone else without a ticket at 9.40, between 9.40 and 10 o'clock, and we'll begin at 10 o'clock with the commencement um, service tomorrow. Tonight, parents and graduates, we're looking for your cooperation. Our alumni reception for the new graduates, for the uh, seniors, will end at 10.30 p.m. We're going to try to be very intentional about ending sharply at 10.30.
And because of that, we're going to have lights out in the dormitories at 1115. So 1115 tonight, we'll have lights out just to give the graduates and the family members a good night's rest before the big event tomorrow. All right, and then uh, as far as church members, I have, there are several announcements in your bulletin, and there's an insert for the Healthy Supper Club. You'll want to take a look at that. And as I finish my announcements, I guess I left the last one for last, or the best one for, the last one for last. Yeah, that's the best one for last, and that is this. Our program is going to shift just a little bit. And I'm telling you that because we have a celebration today. We're celebrating with all the seniors, but we're celebrating the death and resurrection of two of our seniors in the baptismal tank today. Amen. We're going to have two of our seniors being baptized. You couldn't have waited till the last, I mean, you couldn't have waited any longer, but we're so glad, Cameron and Jeffrey, that you have decided to, to make this commitment in front of in front of all these folks to recommit your life to the Lord. And we're going to have that baptism. We're going to have Pastor Daniel come up at this moment to read the baptismal vows. And we will have those baptisms right after the church family prayer. I pray that you're all blessed this morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Yes, we are excited that we have uh, some seniors that are graduating. But we are also excited where we have two young men who decide to recommit themselves to the Lord. So at this time, we're going to go through the vows. And with each vow, after the vow, you will say, I do or yes. I believe there is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a unity of three co-eternal persons. I accept the death of Jesus Christ on Calvary as the atoning sacrifice for my sins and believe that through faith in his shed blood, I am saved from sin and its penalty. I renounce the world and its sinful ways and have accepted Jesus Christ as my personal savior, believing that God for Christ's sake has forgotten my sins and given me a new heart. I accept by faith the righteousness of Christ, my intercessor, in the heavenly sanctuary and accept his promise of transforming grace and power to live a loving Christ-centered life in my home and before the world. I believe that the Bible is God's inspired word, the only rule of faith and practice for the Christian. I covenant to spend time regularly in prayer and Bible study. I accept the Ten Commandments as the transcript of the character of God and the revelation of his will. It is my purpose by the power of the indwelling Christ to keep this law, including the fourth commandment, which requires the observance of the seventh day of the week of the Sabbath of the Lord and the memorial of creation. I look forward to the soon coming of Jesus and the blessed hope when this mortal shall put on immortality as I prepare to meet the Lord, I will witness to his loving salvation and by life and word, help others to be ready for his glorious appearing. I accept the biblical teaching of spiritual gifts and believe that the gift of prophecy is one of the identifying marks of the remnant church. I believe in church organization. It is my purpose to support the church by my tithes and offering and by my personal effort and influence. I believe that my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and will honor God to, by caring for it, avoiding the use of that which is harmful. I know and understand the fundamental, fundamental Bible principles as taught by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I purpose by the grace of God to fulfill His will by ordering my life in harmony with these principles. I accept the New, New Testament teachings of baptism by immersion and desire to be so baptized as a public expression of faith in Christ and his forgiveness for my sins. I accept and believe that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the remnant church of Bible prophecy and that people of every nation, race, and language are invited and accepted into its fellowship. Let the church say, Amen. Amen. And we are excited for them. And later on, we will have our baptism. So now we're going to prepare our hearts to be in service with the Lord.
Happy Sabbath, everyone. Please join us in singing our first song, number 499, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, hymn number 499.
Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us all here together this morning. We want to thank you, especially this weekend, for guiding the seniors to this point in our lives. And right now, we just want to ask for your presence as we hear what you have laid on the speaker's heart. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Our offering, for, our offering for today is for Michigan Advanced Partners. What if you are told there is a place where holy angels are constantly on duty, where the staff comes to serve campers wholeheartedly, and where decisions to follow Jesus were solidified in the lives of young people and the young at heart? Praise God that such a place exists in Grayling, Michigan. It's called Camp Asabel. Throughout the summer, campers arrive each week and experience morning and evening worships, cabin family worships, a Friday night passion play, and special Sabbath at the chapel in the woods. Activities are constantly interspersed throughout the day, and each class begins their adventure by asking Jesus to join in on the fun. At Camp Asabo, the campers share how they have seen Jesus work dramatically in their own lives in seeing their joy explode while sharing the wonders he has done. There have been stretches of time that exceed half an hour where the campers are on a roll taking turns expressing their thankfulness for how their guardian angels save them, a family member, or a friend. It is beautiful to see the campers' confidence in Jesus soar as they dwell on his goodness and remember his perfect providing. The summer camp evangelist teaches the Bible discovery class and gets so excited telling testimonies of spiritual breakthroughs that happen with their students. Camp Asabo is a place where lives are transformed, characters are changed to be more like Christ, and faith is strengthened. Please join Michigan Advanced Partners where 4% or four cents of every dollar goes to Campus Sable, where the youth camp and many workshop and training sessions are held throughout the year that lead people of all ages to a saving relationship with Jesus. Will the deacons please stand? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for trusting us with fu your funds. Help us to faithfully return our tithes and offerings to honor you. Thank you for Campus Sable and its role in saving souls. Help us to dig as deeply as possible to support this ministry. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.
What a treat. What a treat. Amen? We have a pew up here that is, except for one person, completely empty. So if you'd like to come find a seat here, we have some seats next to our juniors as well. It is now time for our children's story. So all the children, we have baskets here in the front and in the back, and you can collect the offering that will help benefit the kids going to the Cedar Lake Elementary School. And our story will be told by Caitlin Norcross this morning.
So I'm going to read a Bible verse to you, and it's found in Proverbs, Proverbs 22, 6. It says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. So when I was little, we had this thing at our house called a VCR. It's where you like put tapes in it, and you get to watch a movie on the TV. And it had lots of colors on it, lots of buttons that I like to push. Well, one day, my dad told me not to stick my hand in the VCR. He said, no, don't do that. That's you don't want to do that. That's gonna get, you're going to hurt your fingers. Well, he kept telling me no, and I didn't listen. And I pushed the eject button, and I stuck my hand in there. So my hand got caught, and I couldn't pull it out. Well, I got really sad, and I started crying because it hurt, and I couldn't get my hand out. So after that, he pushed, he pushed the tape back in, and I was able to pull my hand out. So... As you get older, temptations will get bigger, and it's important to follow the guidance of your parents. So the Bible verse again is, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Would anybody like to pray? Okay. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you that you died for us. Please be with Joshua White. Amen. Okay, you can go back to your seats now. so hard to let you go, but in this life I know you have to be where you were made to be. And as you step out on the road, I'll say a prayer, so that in my heart you always will be there. your life begin cause this is not goodbye it's just I love you to take with you until you're home again stirring in your soul Remember that your dreams, they are a promise. 
that you were made to change the world so don't let fear stop you now cause this is not goodbye I know we'll meet again so let your life begin cause this is not goodbye it's just I love you to take with you until you're home again I know the brightest star above Was created by the one who loved More than we'll ever know To guide you in your loss What started as a still small voice Is raging now and your only choice Is to follow who you are so follow who you are, cause this is not goodbye. I know we'll meet again, so let your life begin, cause this is not goodbye. It's just I love you to take with you until you're home. All right, let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you so much for this day. Lord, we come boldly before you right now, and we ask for your angels to fill the sanctuary and for your Holy Spirit to fill our lives. And Lord, just please be with us the rest of the service. Help us give you total honor, glory, and praise. And please be with the baptisms now. And please bless their hearts and their lives and their families too. In your name, amen. everyone here we go again we are happy uh, to see that we have two young people two young men who want to be rebaptized um, if we have family or friends that want to come closer they can you can stand here in the aisle or in the side here and we see we have some students that's gonna come so they can be part of this baptism and I want you to give just a, a little backdrop drop of this um, back in January, we had a Emmanuel session, Emmanuel Institute, where we focused on evangelism and building a foundation of our faith. And we had it here at GLA. And we had young people, after their experience, after five days of Bible boot camp, they wanted to recommit themselves to the Lord. And Jeffrey and Cameron were one of the two. And so we are excited about that. And Jeffrey, I, I asked Jeffrey, he's, you know, he's an introvert, just like me. And I asked him to share something. So it might be quick. So here he is, as he, as he wanted to share his testimony. All right, so I was baptized when I was like 12 or so. But like, I, I didn't really know what it meant. It was just like, oh, I want to be baptized so I can go to heaven. Um, but like since then, I don't know. God's just been teaching me a ton of stuff, and, you know, um, I've learned so much from, like, going canvassing um, and just doing various, like, service, and I'm like, man, okay, I want to commit my life to God for real this time, so. Amen. Yeah. Amen. We praise the Lord. Amen. We like that his family is here with us, and, uh, you know, we, we love the promises in God's word. When Paul says, when we are de dead in the, um, in the water, that we come out as a new creature in Christ. And so I'm praying that as he commit himself to the Lord, that he will further the work to hasten the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen.
Jeffrey Saley, because of your faith and your love for Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Why don't we pray together? Father in heaven, we know heaven is rejoicing at this time. And Father, I just pray, Lord, that you would put a hedge about Jeffrey. I pray, Father, that you would guide his life. I pray, Father, that he'll be a missionary for you. So, Father, I pray that you would be with him. Guide him, Father. And I pray, Lord, that we can add more people into your kingdom. Please be with us now. We ask in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. privileged to be standing in this baptistry this morning with Cameron. Our first assignment here in Michigan was to pastor the church that Cameron was at and his family were members of. And during that process, we got to know Cameron a little bit, but not much at all. 
And the blessing is, is this year being chaplain Bible teacher here, we've gotten to know Cameron and see his love for the Lord and his desire to grow. And during the Emmanuel Institute, seeing Cameron's decision for baptism, I still remember the call that he responded to and just seeing the Lord working in his life. And Cameron wanted to make sure there was one thing that happened, that he wasn't just re-baptized not knowing what he was doing, but he wanted to know what the decision meant. And so studying with him for the last four months has been a tremendous blessing. And I truly believe that the Lord is going to be doing powerful things in and through Cameron's life. And Cameron wanted to share a little bit of his story, just the journey in brief of how the Lord's led him to this point. Well, I was also baptized when I was probably 12. Very young, I just really didn't know what it meant as well. And so I've been going here for four years, having all these Bible classes. First few years I didn't get it. And then Bible boot camp came around and that year I was already starting to feel like you need to do something more about your faith. Mm. But Bible boot camp showed me so much that I didn't know before, and it's real. Amen. And Amen. I just had to re-give myself to the Lord. Amen. 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 You know, as I think about Cameron, I think about Paul speaking to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 seeing the work that God had entrusted Timothy to do. And it says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman who needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I believe this is what the Lord is going to use Cameron to do. And Cameron, because of your commitment to the Lord and your desire to serve him, it's my privilege to now baptize you in the name of the Father who loves you so much, in the name of his Son who died for you, in the name of the Spirit who promises to be your comfort, and your God. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, Lord, you tell us that we not only need to be baptized with water, but Lord, we also need your spirit. Father, we pray that in a very special way, as you've seen Cameron's decision today to surrender his life to you in the watery grave of baptism, that, Father, you would fill his heart and his life with your spirit, that you would revive him like never before. Father, we pray that you would fill him, that wherever he goes, he would be an agent of yours, sharing the gospel and the good news with those around him. Father, bless his life, bless his family. And we pray that by your grace, we will not only meet in the kingdom together, but Lord, with those who you've used Cameron to bring there as well. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Before we go today, I want to give an opportunity to those of you who have witnessed the baptisms today. There are others who have been on the fence whether or not maybe you too should be committing your life to the Lord in baptism or rebaptism. And there's never a better time than today. And if it's your desire to say, Lord, I know that I need to either start preparing for baptism or rebaptism. You've been calling on my heart and my life. I just invite you to raise your hand at this time. Lord, I know that I need to be baptized or rebaptized. God bless you. Is there anyone else? God bless you, brother. You sense that the Lord is calling you to be rebaptized or baptized. And we just want to give you the opportunity to respond today. I invite those who raise their hands to meet with me after the church service out in the foyer. Uh, may God bless you as we continue through this service together. The scripture reading will be found in 1 Kings 2 3. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. It's found in 1 Kings 2 3. And it says, And keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways to keep.
keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. Amen. Happy Sabbath. So I've been given the privilege to introduce our speaker today, and if you look in your, uh, your bulletin program thingies, you'll see that um, the, introduce, the person who introduces the speaker is named David Glenn, and the speaker is named David Glenn. And um, just to kind of illustrate how that, that name confusion goes sometimes, um, last year I was sitting working, I worked in the history department last year, and I was sitting and Mr. Reichert was teaching government class and I was grading papers in his office and all of a sudden the door opened and the whole classroom started singing me happy birthday and it was May 3rd, which is my father's birthday <laughs> and mine is, mine is in August. So it was, it was one of those things where I, like, I, I looked and I was like, is it my birthday? Probably not, I don't think so. <laughs> and, and, like, I, I knew it was my dad's birthday but I stood up, I was like, why are they singing to me? And I took two steps out of the door. I was like, oh, it's my dad. Yeah, that, that's the connection. And uh, I, after everyone was done singing, I said, it's my dad's birthday. <laughs> and if you know me, like, I'm easily embarrassed. So it's kind of like, it's my dad's birthday. But I'll make sure I tell him happy birthday from the, the uh, government class. <laughs> so I called him up later. And I was like, hey, dad, the government class sang you happy birthday today. <laughs> Happy birthday! So, um, to avoid that, um, that confusion in the bulletin, the introducer of the speaker is David Glenn, and the speaker himself is Mr. Dave Glenn. And if you want, if you want to like, know the numbers, um, there are actually three David Glens in the room right now. We have David Glenn the fourth, David Glenn the fifth, and David Glenn the sixth. So, pressure's on if I have another kid. <laughs> Not, not another, sorry, that came out bad. <laughs> okay. Three, three things you should know about my dad. First of all, he uh, works in business management for a cybersecurity company. Second, he loves his family, and most importantly, he loves God. So it is my honor and privilege to introduce to you Mr. David Glenn. Praise God. Since I'm going to be talking to you guys, I'm going to pull this over a little bit. I might actually say something to them once in a while too, but... Thank you, Mr. Garcia, for the uh, water. It is only water, and it tastes really good. Um, let's pray. Father God... Today we are in your presence. We invite your presence here, and we ask that you touch our hearts, that you let us hear you. Um, please speak through me. If you have something different to tell me, for me to tell people than what you already asked me to share, then please make that apparent. Um, bless each and every one of these students, their teachers that have given so much, and their families that have sacrificed to send them to this school. Please help us all to be in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Hudson Taylor was the founder of the China Inland Mission, and he did a great work for God in China. This experience took place when he was journeying to China for the very first time. So it was just, he, he was it, falling off. There we go. I got it. There we go. All right. Technical difficulties. Always happens to me. Um, so he's on a sailing trip. He's, he's on his first mission to, uh, to China. And uh, they become becalmed just off the shores of, of Papua New Guinea. And at the time, that area was known for its cannibals. And as they sat there for several days, sitting on the water, no winds, they, gr they, dr they drew closer and closer to the island. They could see the coral reefs. They knew that soon they might actually um, go, go aground and maybe be dinner. 
um, they actually saw some cannibals on the beach preparing a fire. And um, in his own words, we could see the savages on the shore. They'd kindled the fire, and they were evidently expecting a good supper that night. When I was a medical student, some of the other students used to jeer at me because I was going among the heathen, and they would talk about cold missionary. Well, it did look that night as if someone was going to have a piece of hot missionary. The captain said, we can't do anything else but let down the longboat. They tried to turn the head of, head of the vessel around from the shore, but in vain. It had been several weeks since they were able to use their sails to move, and um, the captain said, pretty much they gave up. Hudson Taylor said, wait a second, there's one more thing that we have not tried, and I think they probably should have tried it in the first place, but they said, let's pray. There are only three Christians on that boat, the captain, Hudson Taylor, and then the steward. So they, they all agreed to pray in the name of Lord Jesus Christ, um, uh, our Father, and his Father for a breeze immediately. So they went to the cabin, and Hudson Taylor told the Lord, I'm just on my way to China. I'm trying to do your work. You sent me. I can't get there if I'm shipwrecked and eaten. Please send us a breeze. It is wonderful to be in God's house today, amen? amen. What an amazing class, amen? Amen. You know, I look at all of you and, and I see the incredible potential that's here. Um, we've had the opportunity to watch you grow from sometimes timid and shy and others boisterous and hyper, from, that, from those starting freshmen that are finishing the awkward stage between child, childhood and adolescence to those incredible adults that you've become and continue to become. Your personalities have, have uh, developed more completely. You've made friendships that are going to last a lifetime. And for some of you, you've made some little more special friendships that maybe actually give you a lifetime partner in God's work. I'd like to start by thanking the teachers, uh, Mr. Garcia and all the rest of the teachers here. What an incredibly amazing dedication and devotion and sacrifice you've given. So thank you. On behalf of all the students here, and all, on behalf of all the parents here and, the, uh, and our families, we could not be more blessed than to have our children come to the school. It's been an incredible, amazing experience for us. It's taught me several lessons about Adventist education. If you are thinking about sending your child to go to school here, trust your child into these people's care and then pray for them every single day. Get involved as you can. Support this ministry. For those of you that don't have children that are high school age, if, if they're very young, Jaden, Jack, um, and, and your parents, start thinking about what it's going to take to send them to the school. Um, Mr. Garcia told me I, only, I have under two hours, so I just want to make sure I keep track of time. <clears throat> Our minds were created by God. The fundamental beauty of us cre as created beings is we were built in the image of the Creator Himself. Turn with me to Genesis 1. And uh, taking a page from my son's speaking manual, please put your hand on top of your head when you find it. All right, I see a couple of hands on top of heads. Great. So Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the, f of, over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. You are created, God, you are created in God's image. Then God looked around and he said, he saw all that he has created, and it was good. God was pleased when he created you. And he created you to be your very, very best you. But God did not create us as robotic reflections of his perfect will. He gave us the gift of free will. We, we sometimes do very poorly with that. But God has given us that gift. Every single day when you wake up, you have choices. The moment you wake up in the morning, you choose, do I get up immediately? Do I hit the snooze button and get that 20 minutes of extra sleep? Or in Tina, Tina in my case, 5 o'clock in the morning, which turns into 6.30 sometimes. She hates it when I hit snooze over and over and over again. Uh, 10 minutes at a time, hour and a half of sleep. It's not really sleep, but I, I convince myself it is. How will I start my day? Will I get up on the right side of the bed? Am I going to take time for Jesus first thing in the morning? God gives in his word, this book right here, clear guidance on how to live our best lives. In the pages of this book are the answers to all of life's questions. 
How to be free from grief, from guilt, from shame, from sin. How to be healthy through the habits that we create. How to achieve success in the things we do. How to be blessed by God. One of the shortest but most complete stories and powerful promises in the Bible is found in 1 Chronicles 4, 9, and 10. If you'll turn there with me, I would appreciate that. If you have your Bibles today. And if you don't, bring them next time. 1 Chronicles 4, 9, and 10. And I'm too nervous to pay attention as to whether or not you're touching. Oh, there, there you go. Mr. Gardner was touching his head. Thank you. And I hope I don't steal any of your verses, Mr. Gardner. This is called by some, by some the prayer of Jabez. And someone has even written a small devotional book on living a full and successful life about it. It says this. Now Jabez was more honorable than his brothers, and his mother called his name Jabez, saying, Because I bore him pain. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory that your hand would be with me and that you would keep me from evil, that I may not cause pain. So God granted what he requested. Uh, Dean Hill's father actually shared this, with, shared this message with me when I was a, a, a business person starting out and, and was wondering how do, I, how do I best comport myself in my business that reflects God's character. So in this very, in this very interesting um, you know, short, short story. You know, Jabez isn't mentioned. Uh, he's, I think he's mentioned one other place in, in the Bible, and this is in the middle of one of those, you know, in the sons of Judah were Perez, Hezron, Carmi, Hur, Shobal, Rhea, the son of Shobal, begot Jahath, and Jahath begot Ahumai and, Le- and Lahad. Don't you sometimes, when you're looking through these genealogies in the Old Testament, you're like, oh, man, and, and, and it runs into, you know, all of, all of these things that run together, and I get distracted sometimes. And right in the middle of this, which is, which is, a, le- which is a lesson to us. Um, Zig Ziglar says, I believe my whole Bible from Genesis to maps. And so, you know, everything in the Bible has, has the opportunity to give, us, to give us a lesson. So Jabez, well, it's a great and powerful prayer and a really powerful promise. Jabez asked for God's blessing. He asked for more responsibility. He asked that God be with him and that he, and that he be kept from doing wrong. And God granted what he requested. Jabez asked. He did God's will. And God granted what he requested. God listens. When we earnestly seek him in prayer, he always listens and he always answers, sometimes not in the time that we want. He sometimes doesn't give us what we want, but he gives us what's in his will. He tells us what adjustments we need to make to live our best lives in service to him and those around us. That is, how to adjust our sails. And again, this formula, this promise of of a fulfilling and fulfilled life isn't just random. It's not just some vague directionless change. These are instructions If we listen to God and allow him to work his will in our imperfect lives, the results can be astounding. In fact, I'd argue that right here there's a prescription for all that ails us, for everything that perplexes for any situation. The God of heaven has put this in the pages of the Bible. This conversation of prayer, this invitation to build a relationship. If we just listen to God and allow him to work his will in our imperfect lives, the results can be amazing. Um, He's there in moments of joy. He's he's in, in the moments of peace. He, and he's also in, in, here in life's darkest times, the most desperate situations of heartbreaking, earth-shaking loneliness and desperation and sadness. He's there. If you're worried, can't handle the weight of the world, Psalms 55, 22 says, cast your burden on the Lord and he shall sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. Cast it on God. Give it to God. There's no reason to ever worry because if you give that to God, you understand that there's a perfect plan and that soon we're going to be together in heaven. I'm going to be 40 pounds lighter. Um, I'm going to be able to run really, really fast. I'm, I'm probably going to be able to do a, uh, uh, whatever you call it, two high, three high, whatever. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, in fact, I want to fly sometime. I want some giant to make me, I want him I want to throw me up in the air and, and, and make me do flips. I, I don't know. I've always wanted to do that. I never could. Sick, he's got an answer for that too. In James 5, 14 to 16, it says, Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. And let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, he'll be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. 2009, when I was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, and it was terrifying to me. The idea that my brain, I love to read, the idea that my brain was going to slowly rot and I was going to dissipate I was going to lose all my function. I was going to start shaking and be unable to engage. Scared me to death. And I, so I spent the next several years 
in, in the depths of my soul crying out to God saying, why did you do this to me? Why would you put this in, in, my, in my path? Did I do something? What? I, I mean, I understand I, I've done many things that are wrong, but why this punishment? It got to the point where I couldn't get up in the morning. It got to the point where I was feeling sorry for myself. And I, although I tried not to share this with other people, I am sh- quite certain that I was a giant pain in the neck to my family. Positive. I got, got to the point where I couldn't button my shirts. It got to the point where I didn't know if I could drive my car in the morning. And then I began to say to God, this is you, this is yours. If you want me to die, please just get it out of the way. Um, if you want me to live, then let me live. I was talking to my dad and some elders from the Grand Blank Seventh-day Adventist Church, um, John Hill, Dr. Fernandez, uh, Mr. Garcia, um, and, and I really was at the point where I was thinking, I'm not going to be able to work anymore, so how, what's my best exit strategy? What's the best way for me to save my, my family from disappointment and discouragement? I was anointed, and since then, I, I, I was at the point where I could not have stood in front of you. In fact, for my aunt's funeral, I, I shook so badly that my notes fell out of my hands, and I almost burst into tears in front of the church. Since then, God has given me an amazing opportunity to not only function, but function well. I'm performing better in my job than I ever have in my life. I'm excited. I'm thrilled to get up and and work in the morning. I've lost weight. I have a tremendous amount of energy. So what I'm saying to you is this is not not my story. This This is a story for everybody. If you give yourself to God, everything that you have, everything that you are, that may not be a healing process. I still have frustrating mornings. But God will give you the courage and the power and the strength to get through anything. There's nothing God cannot help you with. We heard in today's scripture reading from King David's deathbed, words to King Solomon in the book of 1 Kings 2, 2, and 3. And this is really powerful. Please turn with me there. 1 Kings 2, 2 through 3. It's going to take me a minute, I think. All right. So David's on his deathbed. The days of David grew near, drew near that he should die, and he charged Solomon, his son, saying, this is David on his deathbed talking to his son, giving his son instructions. And he says, I go the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore, and prove yourself a man. And keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, and his testimonies as, as it has been written in the law of Moses. You may prosper in all you do and wherever you turn. Keep his statutes, prosper in all you do and wherever you turn. Piece of cake, right? Pretty easy to follow God's commandments, right? No way. It's impossible. We're weak and sinners. How do we possibly follow all these do's and all these don'ts? How is it? What do we do? Get up in the morning, read the, Bible, read the Ten Commandments, and say, all right, I didn't kill anybody t- yesterday, so I'm not going to do that again today. Um, when that police officer pulled me over, that wasn't really a lie when I told him I didn't know I was speeding. No. We don't do anything. It takes a daily rooted personal experience that a real, and a relationship with Jesus to make this possible. He's a big God. He's the creator of all the universe. He can do anything for you. He will, he will do anything. There are many places in the Bible that, that address how we, how we as flawed human beings can possibly be made worthy. Turn with me to the book of Acts. One of my favorite stories in the Bible. Um... Acts 16, verse 30. It's the beginning of prison ministries. Um, so what happened is, is uh, Paul and Silas, and we're pretty sure Luke, were traveling, and God had, had kept stopping them and saying, no, 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 keep going. And, and they'd had this vision from God about going to Macedonia. A man from Macedonia said, please come to Macedonia and help us. So Paul and Silas, and we think Luke again, were traveling, and they got to Philippi, and there was a, a young lady that was a fortune teller, and she was, she was possessed of a demon, and she started following these guys, and, and she made a lot of money for her masters. So she started following these guys around, and, and she was saying, um, what was it? She, she was saying stuff. Um, she was saying, it's pretty cool. She's saying, uh, these are servants of the Most High God. Let's see. These men are the servants of the Most High God who pro- proclaim us the way of salvation. And she did this for a bunch of days. So she's following him around. And, and so here's a, for, a demon-possessed fortune teller walking around behind Paul and Silas saying, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. So Paul was kind of annoyed. I, 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 I like this story because it, it shows that these apostles that we look up to, these, these guys were people. 
you know, Paul, Paul didn't necessarily get along with people very well. He, John, John Mark annoyed him. Um, but so Paul was annoyed. So he turned around and he said, he said to the, the demon that was in her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And she came out, she came out, uh, the, the demon came out that very hour. Interestingly enough, I wonder if she stopped saying these men are servants of the Most High God. She probably kept saying it, just not in quite such an annoying way. So anyway, their masters, her masters were mad. Um, they were making a lot of money from her. And so they dragged him in front of the magistrates and, he got, and, and Paul and Silas got thrown in jail. Um, and, and in fact, they got put in stocks. So if you, get, you went to Washington, D.C., or Bo- maybe your Boston trip, you guys probably saw stocks on your Boston trip, right? Yeah? So can you imagine being stuck in stocks? Your, your hands and feet are stuck through these things. You can't move. There's probably pressure on your spine. Your back probably hurts really bad. If, you're old, if, if they were old like me, I don't know if they were that old, but the, their back probably hurt really bad. I, I don't know if I could sit in stocks. And, and I, I'm sure I wouldn't be able to sing in stocks unless God gave me the power to do that. So here they are, cramps on every muscle, hang, dangling from these stocks, and they start singing hymns, and they're praying. And I'm sure the other, the other prisoners were, were shaking their heads going, what are these crazy nuts doing? But all of a sudden, there's an earthquake. The ground starts to shake, and all the prisoners are set free. The doors open, stocks fall off, and all the prisoners are set free. So the jailer realizes what, what's happened, and he realizes, if I let these, all these prisoners go... They're going to kill me. So he decides he's going to end it. He's going to take his Japanese samurai sword, plunge it through his body, and fall over dead. Um, Paul and Silas uh, tells him they're still there, and there's a powerful conversion story that happens there. That's not what we're talking about, though, the whole thing. It's the small Q&A that resonates down through the ages, and he's talking to you and you and you and all of you. The jailer says, Sirs, what must they do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. That's it. Believe. Build a relationship. There's no magic potion. There's no secret handshake. You don't have to get up every morning and say, all right, this is all the stuff I'm going to do to follow God's law. This is what I'm going to do to make it right. This is about Jesus Christ. Believe, build a relationship. That is it. And if anybody ever tells you differently, it's just simply not true. When we're living in accordance with God's will, when we have a relationship with God, we will naturally follow his perfect example. It's the nature of deepening our relationships with Jesus or anybody else. We begin to be like them. As we spend time with Jesus, we dwell on him and become like him. We act like him, not because someone told us to or we're afraid of damnation. No, it's because when we hang out with somebody, we become like them. We, like, we do things they like to do. That mat- they, they matter to us. And this person, he gave his whole life for us. And the cool thing is that the Bible's bursting with advice on how to live a happy and fulfilled life. A full and fulfilled life. Not always happy, not always peaceful, not always free from sickness and injury, but a fulfilled and full life. And even hard science, secular philosophy, self-help gurus, and management books, they can't argue with the simple logic of it all. They can try to explain it away, but they can't argue. The fundamental sense of of the Ten Commandments, the things that God has asked us to do, they're, they're, they're buoyed up by science. We'll talk about that in just a second. There's so many examples. Here's a couple I really like. Uh, what's, the, what's the second shortest verse of the Bible? Anybody? Anyone? What is it? Rejoice always. That's right. Where, anybody know where that's found? Thank you, Mr. President. 16, not 6, but close. Um, rejoice always. First Thessalonians 5, 16. Rejoice always. Then 17 and 18 says, Pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. When we rejoice and we're happy, what do we do sometimes? We laugh, right? When you're happy, you laugh sometimes. The Mayo Clinic reports, A good laugh has great effects. When you start to laugh, it doesn't just lighten your load mentally. It actually induces physical changes in your body. Laughter can stimulate many organs. Laughter enhances your your intake of oxygen-rich air, stimulates your heart, lungs, and muscles, and increases the endorphins that are released by your brain. It activates activates and relieves your stress response. A A rollicking laugh or a hearty laugh fires up, then cools down your stress response. And it can increase your heart rate and blood pressure in a good way, giving you a a, a good and relaxed feeling. It soothes tension. It can also stimulate uh, circulation and muscle relaxation, both of which can reduce some of the physical symptoms of stress. Pray without ceasing. This one's kind of tough. Really? Pray without ceasing? Does that work? Praying all the time? This doesn't mean stay in a closed room on your knees all the time, although I should probably do a little bit more of that. It means that whenever the moment arises... 
feel guilt, confess it to God right there, right in your head. Um, if, it's for, if it's towards somebody else, talk to them about it. Don't worry. Jesus is always listening. 1 John 1, 9 says that if we do that, he watches us clean and he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, washed, washed perfectly clean. Uh, Dr. Clay Rutledge, in a March 2016 article, talks about some scientifically proven benefits of prayer. I'm sorry, when I'm nervous, my mouth gets dry. Um, research published by Malta Fries and Michaela Wanky in the Journal of Experimental Social Psychology in November 2013, using the Stroop effect, showed that prayer helps build and maintain self-control. In March 2011, and Michael, I promise I cited the actual, in, in, you know, if you want to look at it later, the actual research is cited in here. Um, they published a summary of multiple experiments in the SAGE journal that shows that prayer effectively helps manage and reduce anger. Research published in 2009 showed that prayer helps people to forgive and helps build and maintain a healthy, uh, re healthy relationship, healthy romantic relationships. There are several more research studies that seem to support that prayer of thanksgiving and relationship building is an effective weapon against stress and helps bolster physiological and psychological health. Um, <clears throat> you're created in the image and likeness of God. You're hardwired by the creator so that your whole being is scientifically engineered to benefit from habitual committed prayer. It's scientific. We've, we now understand based on, based on our scientific methods that God is in control, that God has given us these bodies, these minds that benefit directly from prayer. It's, it's, it's amazing. Even when you talk to people that, that, that know that God is not real, they, under, they begin to understand. When you talk about this, the scientific research, they begin to understand that this is the way our bodies are created. You can't argue with that. <clears throat> I know in my own marriage that when we began to pray together, something special happened in our relationship. Every time we stop praying together, well, bad news. Um, our relationship suffers. As you enter into romantic friendships, make sure you pray together. In, fighting, in fact, inviting God's presence into any relationship makes it stronger and less apt to failure. Um, in one of our Pathfinder worships a couple years ago, we looked at this acronym called CHAT. Any of you that were, that were Pathfinders, do you guys remember what CHAT stands for? What's the C? Nobody remembers? Confess. The H? Come on, guys. I'm going to make you stand up and sing the Pathfinder song if you don't get one of these. <laughs> Hallelujah. A. What's A? Ask. Thank you. And T? Thanksgiving. Natalie, did you, like, like, creep on one of our worships or something? Like, seriously, Natalie got this. Anyway, so, so it's, a, it's a pretty cool formula. Confess your sins. This is where I did wrong. Please forgive me. Hallelujah. You are an awesome big God. You're amazing. Thank you for making all of these things that you've made. What an amazing thing being the creator is. Ask. Now, God doesn't want us to just go to him when we need something. He's not Santa Claus. But there are things that we need to ask God for. Sometimes we don't need to ask God for things. We need to ask him for understanding. We need to ask him for, the, for discernment, the ability to, to, to know what's going on. And then thankfulness. We need to consistently be thankful to God for the things that he's given us. I don't know about you guys, but I'm so proud to be an American. I'm so proud to live in this country where I'm free. God gave us that. God gave us that. Amazing. <clears throat> I got lost. Um, so in everything, give, th give thanks. In Psychology Today, psychologists Robert Emmons and Michael McCullough point out that gratitude is the forgotten factor in happiness research. They point out the benefits of expressing gratitude as ranging from better physical health to improved mental alertness. People who express gratitude are also more, likely to suffer, to off, also more likely to offer emotional support to others. So again, the, the, uh, back to the, back to the uh, what was the verse that I, that I was just talking about? Um, yeah, so rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Expressing gratitude in your daily life might even have a, protect, uh, might even have a protective effect at saving off cer certain forms of psychological disorders. In a review article, researchers found that habitually focusing on and appreciating the positive aspects of life is, is related to a generally higher level of psychological well-being and a certain lower risk of certain forms of psychopathology. I read this because I don't really understand all these words. Um, so James 1.19. Uh, turn your Bibles to James, James 1.19, please. James 1.19 says this. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. There's so much wisdom in this really short verse. In life, listening has one of the great, listening has had one of the greatest impacts on my career. 
I'm pretty shy by nature. I don't like being in front of people. I don't like being in crowds. It's really difficult for me to strike up a conversation with someone. I'm painfully shy. When I, enter, when I seriously entered the business world, um, gatherings terrified me. Networking events, no way. I don't want to do it. I don't know sports as well as some other people. I really enjoy watching, watching and participating in sports, but I don't get it. I don't keep stats. I can't, I can't make it through a baseball game without fidgeting. Um, I'm just, I just don't have the attention span for it. Now, I love being there. I love being at the ballpark and the smell of hot dogs, just the smell. Um, the smell of hot dogs, the, uh, you know, the, the, the crowd. Um, I'm a Tigers fan, but if, you, if you've ever been to Fenway Park, yeah, go Tigers. Um, but if you've ever been, ever been to Fenway Park uh, or the old Tiger Stadium, you feel baseball. It's a pretty cool feeling. But I don't, I don't, I don't know the stats. I can't tell you whether JV is still a good pitcher or not. You know, I, I, just, I, I just don't pay attention enough. I enjoy history very much and think it's important to be cognizant of the world around us in current events, but I don't read the paper every day. I don't watch the news every day. It's just not, I don't know, maybe my head's full of other useless information, but I don't spend a lot of time doing that. So some of the things that are very important from a business perspective in, in, in engaging with people, I just, I, I can't be bothered to just learn that stuff for the sake of learning it. If I'm not passionate about it, I have a hard time, I have a hard time paying attention. Um, but a mentor of mine told me once that if I ever fell out of, fell out of place, if the situation felt, felt awkward, just ask questions and actively listen. Um, it worked wonders when I started doing that. Most people by their very nature want to talk about what, at what matters most to them. They want to have a conversation about their latest hobby, whatever else. And that's the way you get to know people. I can't think of any occupation, any career that won't benefit from you getting to know people. People are, are important to this. Unless you want to be a research, research, research scientist or a developer chained to a table in a basement with bread and water coming over, under the door, you've got to deal with people in this world. Um, and, and, and the more and more technology takes over, takes over our lives, um, I'm looking forward to reading. I think there's a paper that some, one of you seniors did on, on technology, and I'm looking forward to reading that sometime. But, but um, if you find out what's important to other people quickly, um, Either it's something you might like and might be interested in and you can contribute to the discussion or you might learn something. I'm not suggesting any way that you'll appreciate all the interests and wants of the people around you. There are some pretty weird people out there with some pretty weird hobbies. But you might learn what to stay away from or the fact that you don't ever want to go over to their house for dinner. But be slow to speak. It's important that we listen and process before we speak. I have a bad habit of pre-thinking my, my response to, to, um, uh, before, the, before the person stops talking. So I'm thinking... You know, uh, I'm thinking two-thirds of the way into what you're saying to me. I'm, I've already thought about my response. I don't really care about the last third of that. I've started, I've, I know what my response is going to be. I know how I'm going to deliver it. Partially because I'm a little slower and more deliberate than some of the people I know, I kind of feel like I've got to get a jump on you a little bit. But that listen thing, really, really listen. If you take a second to consider your response, it's usually a better outcome. Process that through the filter of Philippians 4 eight before you go off half-cocked. Consider before you think these three things. Is it true? Is it kind? Is it beneficial? Slow to get angry. I can have a pretty f fast hair trigger and boiling point, but when I stop to think about it before I react, it's almost always just way, way better. Some ideas on anger. My favorite statesman's philosopher, Thomas Jefferson, said, when angry, count to 10 before you speak. If you're really angry, count to 100. Giving yourself time allows you to slow your heart rate down and cool down before you react and maybe react poorly. Practice forgiveness. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32 says, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Get rid of it. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another even as God in Christ forgave you. Distract yourself. Take a deep breath. Journal it. Write about it. Don't scream back at somebody that makes you mad. Go write about it. Go sit down. It'll help you understand yourself later. If you don't keep a journal, do some free writing. Sit down with a piece of paper and just write out everything that possibly comes to your mind. Sometimes you go back and read that and think, wow, it's a little twisted. But, but journal it. Write it down. Exercise. Practice compassion. Bitterness destroys us and anger hurts. So back to Hudson Taylor. So Hudson Taylor goes back up on deck after he's done praying. The second officer, the chief mate, was not a Christian. He was an atheist, in fact. So he went, he went up to him and said, if I were you, I'd let down the mainsail. He said, what would I let down the mainsail for? We've been becalmed here for two weeks, or weeks, what, not two weeks, weeks. Um, Hudson Taylor says, we've been praying for a breeze, and it's going to come in just a second. And the, and the officer swore at him and said, I'm not going to let down the sails for a breeze. I'd rather, I, I'll, show me a breeze, but don't just stand here talking to me about it. 
So as Hudson Taylor, as he, as Hudson Taylor was look, looking, he instinctively looked up, and one of the, one of the uh, sails started rippling in the breeze a little bit. So Hudson Taylor said, see, don't you see the corners of the royals are already shaking? Let down the sails. There's a good breeze coming. We better be ready for it. So now that he saw that, the, the, uh, the, mate, the mate got to work, and soon the sailors were tramping all over the deck. Before the sails were set, the wind was upon them. <clears throat> he saw our prayers had been answered. The captain came up to see what was wrong. He saw our prayers had been answered, and we did not forget to praise God for so signal a deliverance from the perils to which we were exposed. Writing of this and similar experiences later, Hudson Taylor said, Thus God encouraged me before we landed on China's shores to bring every variety of need to him in prayer and to expect that he would honor the name of the Lord Jesus and, and give the help to which that emergency required. If you get a chance, read some Roger Mor something Roger Morneau wrote. Listen to some of Pavel Goya's sermons. There's some amazing things that have happened through the power of prayer. Pay attention to that. It, it, it's inspiring. It'll lift you up. If you're ever depressed, listen to some of those crazy, amazing miracle stories. Hudson Taylor had a mission that had a saying over the door, the ark did float, the axe did sw swim. This God is our God forever and ever. God speaks the wind. We adjust the sails. We go in his direction about his business. Two paths you get to choose. Get mired down in the detritus of the silver screen. Get wrapped up in the, buttle, in the bubble of living vicariously through a plastic actor with benefiting from CGI great makeup and the ability that to, you know, isn't it weird that Hollywood cameras take off 20 pounds and our cameras add 20? I don't know, I don't know what's up with that. Um, burn weeks at a time playing Madden. Guilty. Get stuck in face chat, snapbook land, wallow in fear, jealousy, or bitterness. Or you can start every single day with God. Finish every single day with him. You'll never be alone. Be alive. Make a commitment to live today, today. Spend time with the people that you know. Get everything you can out of life in a single day. You want to figure out how to live your most perfect life and what's most important to you? Have a near-death experience. Have a close call. Get sick. I'm not, I'm not encouraging that to happen to you. But you process things differently. There's a saying that says, no, one, no man ever lied on, lay, lay on his deathbed and said, I wish I would have spent more time at work. The idea is get the best life out of the best things that you do every single day. My children are probably sitting there thinking, hey, is my dad actually saying that up there? But no, it's true. I work a lot. But the fact of the matter is it's true. If you live your life, if you, lived your, if you live your best life, um, go outside, ride a bike, talk to someone new, learn to play the guitar, or maybe a kazoo, share your dreams, tell other people about them. Your legacy, the context, concept and context of what you are to do and where you are to go from this place here, from this day forward, is to have those who come be behind you find you faithful. I stole that from a lyric from a song. I'm not that smart. Um, you're, going for, you're going away from here, some of you to spend time and much of your life in places where if you want a consistent Friday Night Vespers, you're going to have to start it. No one's going to be taking attendance at church or checking to see if you're wearing a tie. You won't be in a Bible class every week, but you can change the world. You can be a witness to others. You can honor these amazing teachers that have given their lives, their time, passion, energy into training and loving you. To your parents, your family members, look at all these people. These people are here to support you. You're going to be one of these people um, sooner than you think. Your family members, your friends, your churches that have sacrificed you by leaving this world and becoming missionaries for Christ, continuing your, your, your role as missionaries for Jesus Christ. Bring a light to the world. Whatever you do, if you decide to be a farmer, a cybersecurity guy, if you, if you decide that you want to fly planes, whatever it is, in whatever you do, you absolutely can take that time to be a missionary for Jesus Christ. Let your legacy, wherever you go, be one that people say things like, man, that person's so positive. I love being around them. What a great listener. I really like talking to them. Or the, be the ultimate aspiration, the ultimate conversation. I see Jesus in you. If we are connected to Jesus, he is in us. You've grown up hearing you're the future of the church, right? Guess what? You're the future, all right, but much more importantly, you're its present. You are the church. You're its now. You know right now how to help worship be relevant to reach, his, to reach the world, to extend the hand of compassion, of hope, of grace, to mirror his hands and be that light to this world. 1 Timothy 4.12 says, Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. You're being called to be the example. Don't let anyone despise your youth. 
you have an amazing talent, an amazing gift to take to the world. You've spent two, three, one, two, three, four years here at Great Lakes Adventist Academy preparing for this day, preparing for what you do this day forward. Today is the most important day because it's the first day of the rest of your life. I had to throw a cliche in there. But it really is. This is the first day of the rest of your life. Everything that you do from here is about your choices. Nobody's going to force anything else on here from you. Many of you are 18 years old already. Some of you are going to be 18 soon. From here out, this is your day. This is your decision. This is your choice. When you get that diploma tomorrow, the whole world is in front of you. You get to decide. You get to decide how well you're going to do. You, decide, you get to decide what you're going to do. You get to decide where you're going to be. Sure, we're going to try to give you as much good advice as we can, and you're still going to have a cure for you when you come home. Um, but guess what? This is about you now. This is about your choices. Today and every day, it's the first day of the rest of your life. You decide what you're going to do. Don't, let, don't lose sight. Don't let go. Hold fast. I got that from your worship last week. Hold fast. Keep a grip on it. I look out and see an amazing group of capable, smart, engaging, awesome human beings made in God, God's image and in his likeness ready to receive your diplomas tomorrow and embark on your life, your dreams, your decisions, and your destiny. I say Godspeed. I'd like to invite the congregation to please stand as we sing our closing hymn, hymn number 462. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Hymn number 462.
Please bow your heads for the benediction. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much for this class. Thank you that we've made it this far, and thank you so much for this beautiful Sabbath day. Thank you for the message that Mr. Glenn taught to us today. Um, a lot of us will be having the first chance to make our own choices for ourselves this upcoming year. So please help us to choose you each and every day and amen. live out our entire lives for you. We thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The congregation may be seated.